All right, so welcome to part D of today, where we're going back to way back, actually, because uh, we're going to start with Rand's storyline, and that's chapter 21, Into the Heart. Uh, so we're jumping way back, and we'll see how far we get through. That's 337. Um, so apparently, Scott thinks this, this is the best part of all the books. Rand storyline. Yeah, the, the, what we're about to go into, uh, if I got that comment correctly. Now, last time we talked about, we opened up with a little alcohol discussion and everything. And he also says, I don't drink alcohol or energy drinks, which uh, I'll have I'll have an extra one for you. But uh, at the same time, I don't do the energy drinks either because I was popping them like crazy for a while. And uh, that wasn't the most intelligent thing, not with a heart condition from birth. Uh, and, but I was working four in the morning to or four 30 in the morning to eight 30 in the evening every day. And I was popping them like crazy. And then something happened and we cannot 100% attribute it to the energy drinks, but they probably weren't helping at the very least, but I went tachycardia for five days. And when I was, when I was uh, working out twice a day, cause I wanted to get into boxing or fighting and I was on something that had a fedra in it before it was banned and after i think three three to five days of that i said oh this isn't right something's wrong here <laughs> yeah so tack for five days so i was averaging 220 beats per minute for five days straight and then uh, a medicine we've discussed before metropolol was what got me down because it's it's a beta blocker kind of uh, thing and and uh and I went back to the doctor and he's like, how do you feel? And I said, I feel a lot better, except I'm just really tired. And he's like, yeah, you just, your heart just ran a marathon for five days straight. You never stopped. And, uh, but yeah, no, you brought up ephedra and I wanted to get right to the book. But when I first started in the MMA scene, I was at a, a kind of a shady old school gym and uh, I was trying to lose weight to get down to where I wanted to kind of Cause I was still a little bit chubby and I wanted to get down to at least, you know, it was reasonable to cut to a good weight class. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I asked for advice from the instructor there. I, I, I love the guy to death and he was a great instructor, but he was not best on this advice. <laughs> he said, okay, we'll go to this nutrition shop and ask for the, uh, I'm blanking on the name of the, uh, Brand lipodrine. Name. lipodrine. Okay. He said, ask for lipodrine, but not the one you can get outside ask for the one under the shelf <laughs> and it's, it's not and shady tell, at all and then tell them i sent you and so i got the original lipodrine which is basically ephedra or ephedrine and uh and i and he said pop two of those with a rock star every day speaking of energy drinks and me being an impressionable youth who should have been smarter than this Pop two with a rock star, went to go get a haircut. And my uh, girlfriend at the time, who's my wife now, took me. And I'm sitting there in the chair going. <laughs> and I got this crazy boner. And I'm just like, I, I got to get home. <laughs> hey, when we got back to the apartment, I was like, so what you doing? <laughs> I mean, I could not sit, I mean, for like a day, I was just like, I'm sure that's healthy. Yeah, no, it, it, I stopped after that point, but it was, it was not the best advice. It probably did have a great metabolic effect, but uh, at the expense of probably almost my life, but mm -hmm. <laughs> definitely uh, made for an uncomfortable haircut. All right. Well, let's see how much of this we can get through. Um, So the first thing that I've mentioned this before that I like that we see the effects of what Rand does here before we actually see what he does. Uh, I think that's a lot of fun. And then Jordan kind of continues that by kind of the, the mystery of what's happening here by not giving us Rand's perspective that it Rand's storyline here starts with Moraine's perspective. Um, so we get uh, 
<clears throat> Sorry, I don't know why my throat's so stupid in the last couple of days. We get the human side of Moraine because even though outwardly she's still herself, she uh, we're getting her thoughts about all of the, the many, many things that are irritating her. Uh, she just doesn't let it show too much anyway. Uh, she does she does kind of give the look to some people. Um, uh, I, I like that we get a little bit of more of Lan and Nanive here um, because she's actually somewhat concerned that he would run off with her uh, that she has she has to double check the bond that he's still close to make sure he hasn't run off. Um, it's it's also fun in hindsight to go from Moraine to go to Moraine's perspective here, uh, you know, on on a reread and knowing what happens with the storyline for the girls. As far as Moraine's concerned, she's just getting them out of her hair, <laughs> not only out of her hair, out of her hair, but more specifically, uh. She's she doesn't want anyone else influencing Rand, and she's annoyed that Egwene didn't go. Um, but she doesn't want to push too hard because even though she has the authority to say get lost, I'm an Aes Sedai and you're only an accepted, um, she doesn't move that overtly. That's not her style. Um, so she's not gonna push that hard. But I like that she thinks that um maybe this jaunt to tant chico will turn up something useful but at least it gets them out of my hair and it's it's a major point in the whole arc of the world that they they find this thing that's dangerous to ran they run up against one of the forsaken and defeat her uh and all all these other things that happen and then of course even more here in the next book when we get into it and as far as moraine moraine is concerned you know who's one of the most clever people in the world literally uh she is she is quite the thinker quite the schemer and and she doesn't see it it's just it's it's a sideshow at best yeah did we get any hints that i'm forgetting of what actually was going on in tanchico before they went off before they went off yeah because because um, they'd gotten there and that civil war had just happened but was well, it going on were they getting rumors of this so remember when uh, when Egwene runs into amos it's in tanchico mm -hmm. she she's accidentally using need to go to and it takes her to tanchico and something is off about the place yeah but does but moraine know that the place is currently under civil war and all of these other factors that you uh, want to send somebody at, into. at this point at, at this point that uh enough rumor has reached uh that 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 whole area is is in a state of chaos still um between be, between the the various wars that are almost on stop there and now you you throw in the dragon sworn and uh and 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 that that whole kind of western side of the continent is is still kind of a mess so she knows that but unless Egwene shared with her and i doubt she would um i don't know that she she has any inkling and even Egwene didn't get it and she she should have and she does later when she's in the world of dreams but but amos gets it that there's something unnaturally off about tanchico when they're when they're there in the world of dreams and it's it it's really creepy, has a kind of a dark mood to it. Um, well, just, just like with an alien, just a forsaken being in town can do that. Exactly. And I, I, I think, I think that was, I think that was a purposeful hint from Jordan that the world of dreams is kind of nightmarish. And I think we, the reader, were supposed to pick up, Oh, Hey, there's a forsaken there. Mm -hmm. um, that, that I think, I think that was a purposeful hint there that that the the characters weren't going to get um i've lost my train of thought
Okay. Yeah, sorry, I derailed you. It was before I asked about, could she have known? You were saying it was nice to see these things. Um, all right, so the bottom of page 338. Um, this is Moraine talking to Egoyne. You should bring him to confide in you. He needs an attentive ear. It will help him to talk out his troubles with someone he can trust. Egoyne gave her a sidelong glance. She was becoming too sophisticated for such simple methods. Still, Moraine had spoken unadorned truth. The boy, boy did need someone to listen, listen, and by listening, lighten his burdens, and it might work. So <laughs> I like that he doesn't tell us what's going on here, but I'm quite sure that what she's thinking what she's meaning is you get him to confide in you and then you tell me <laughs> she's not saying it out loud she's not even thinking it out loud that she wants she wants a Gwen to get Rand's ear to be a confidant so that Moraine will have a string connected to him mm -hmm. and will also have an, uh, an avenue for for getting information because she from the beginning of this chapter she really doesn't like not knowing what's going on and she knows rand is up to something and something major is going to happen and she hates not having the slightest clue about what he's doing um that's that's been a theme for a while though it's just we finally get it from her perspective yeah uh i i also like that you know, Moraine the human here, she still doesn't understand that Egwene doesn't actually have feelings for Rand. That she thinks that the reason she's so agitated about the uh, quote unquote the wool brained mule uh, is because uh, that Egwene is upset that he's been canoodling with Elaine. And, and she just, she doesn't understand that, no, that these are good friends here they talked about it Egwene uh, doesn't have these feelings and she wanted Elaine and Rand to have a moment together so I I, I like that <clears throat> I like that we get this insight it, you know it's something we've ranted about ad nauseum about the stupid freaking tv show and you know I referenced earlier Clifton Duncan and the critical drinkers discussion and 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 I like the point that Drinker made that I can pretty much guarantee you now. And in fact, <laughs> he did this with the show Kenobi when they first saw the trailer. He and, and a number of other people said, yeah, she's not going to be a bad guy. She's going to turn out to be a good guy. Because if you have a marginalized person portraying a character and that character appears to be evil or flawed, it will turn out they're not. And that's but that's why the book works because Moraine is still human as great as she is, as clever as she is, as powerful as she is, she's still human. And just from these first few pages here, we get a number of instances where she's wrong about something. She doesn't get it. I'm trying to think. Cause I listened to two Duncan interviews that I might cross streams with you. I listened to the critical drinker one which I'd never watched any of his stuff before, but I, I'm a uh, follower of Duncan. Uh, and then he had Nerd Roddick on. Nerd Roddick, yeah. He, Nerd Roddick is one I've started watching more recently. I don't remember. I think, I think I started watching Drinker when he kind of first started to explode, which was when he was ranting about the Captain Marvel movie. Um, so I've been watching him for a while. Nerd Roddick is a newer one. Um. Nerd Roddick actually worked in Hollywood, though. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know that. I knew from from what he talked before. I knew that he used to uh, uh, own a comic book shop in San Francisco, and that he has recently uh, fled to the Republic of Texas, and he now lives uh, in, in the San Antonio area. Yeah, so he worked in Hollywood, then he retired to a comic book shop, and then he fled here. Mm -hmm. What got me on that? Oh, I was thinking because you were talking about that with uh, the, the marginalized characters. They were uh, reminiscing on Star Wars again. And Duncan gave the same rant he gave with Critical Drinker, which was 
the moment he saw Finn learn the Jedi mind trick in a day yeah. is when he just tuned out. All right, I'm done now. <laughs> yeah, but then uh, Nerd Roddick brought up. But then when we look at something else, it was confusing because Finn is basically old school blackface theater. He was He's a moron. He's an idiot. He's the comic relief in dumb ways. And it was like, that was the one that threw me off is what he said. So... Yeah, and and then Disney takes him out of the poster for China because you know they're all about inclusion and representation. Mm-hmm. Anyway, <clears throat> anyway, back to the book. Um, I'm curious about this. So three thirty nine, um, because I don't know that we. We, we, we know a little bit about this for when Moraine um, mentions the letter uh, talking about how Ivy and then needs to go to Rudine and she's uh, impressed by what they say when she finds out they're dreamers that's when she kind of feels like she can heat it but still the, the, the beautiful arrogance of Moraine at least Egwene would be out of the way too, and the idle girl would look after her. Perhaps the wise ones really could teach her something of dreaming. That had been the most astounding letter from them. Not that she could afford to heed most of it. So this, the, I mean, this ties right into she, she wanted the girls out of her way because only she is smart enough and clever enough and knows enough. Only, only she can be trusted by herself to guide Rand. And so um, I'm, it's one of those curiosities that, that never gets satisfied of what exactly was in that letter that she's thinking about here. Um, I mean, we can kind of guess based on how the wise ones uh, act when they do get to the waste, uh, the things they say and talk about. But uh, uh, I don't want to get too spoilery, but it is a lesson Moraine learns too late, I shall say. But it is a lesson she learns and has to learn the hard way, uh, which, you know, is back back to the discussions of, you know, Duncan and Drinker and Nerd Erotic And people have to struggle. That's what makes good characters, because we can identify with that, because we all inherently understand struggle and growth. And, and, you know, to the, the, the Force Awakens example of, you know, what's her bucket, Daisy Ridley character just automatically knows. And, and, and Clifton Duncan made the point of that was such an exciting moment in the original trilogy when Luke shows up at the beginning of Return of the Jedi and he has gone from this dumb, dumb farmer kid who doesn't know anything in in the first movie and now he's uh he's 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 serious he's confident and he's doing these tricks that we saw that we saw kenobi doing way back at the beginning so now he's earned something we saw the struggles he had to go through and empire strikes back and so now when he's doing these things he's earned it because he's had to struggle and work to get there yeah, the, o- the only thing about the originals that always threw me off was exactly that progression dynamic was he went from getting Womp Rats with his skimmer to flying an X-Wing in that one little, that one little jaunt across the galaxy. That's the only one that got me because that, that was pretty chronologically. Uh, that was very quick. Yeah, that was, that was pretty quick. Yeah. Because uh, unless you're going to say an X-Wing flies exactly the same as those skimmers. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I think, I think in the first couple of books, because she's so secretive uh, and she's, she's kind of a bully, that Moraine is a very, can be a very annoying character, a very unlikable character. But in this book, she's going to become much more sympathetic because she's going to kind of get punched in the face. Uh, and and have and have to uh, really come to terms with okay, uh, the world is not going to bend itself around me. How how, how do I adjust 
to a, to do what needs to be done. Well, she's the leading example of the MMA saying of uh, the game plan's all well and good till you, till you get punched in the face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, Uh, again, at the bottom of page 340. Um, for an instant, she regretted sending Tom away. She did not like having to waste her time with these petty affairs. But he had too much influence with Rand. The boy had to depend on her counsel. <clears throat> so, again, this is a major flaw in her character. She's not a perfect character. She should have been using Tom. It should have been their counsel. Because she she knows full well how <clears throat> how skilled Tom is and who he is, and but instead of using that, uh, and instead of finding a way to incorporate him and ally with him, it's I need him out of my way, to the detriment of Rand and her and and her plans. Really, uh, we we really see that as. Well, it's it's going to be more so in the next book, but as Rand has to struggle to try and figure out how to be a leader of of nobles. And but that, that was going to be my, my point to cells. what you just said. Is it really to his detriment? Because there's there's well, a, there's apron strings are abound, and it removed some apron strings. Because I would say yes, because whether he did this for personal reasons or because he understood Tom's help was, was in the shadows in the same way that when Elaine would coach him, she didn't want him to take, she didn't want him to give her credit. She wanted to make sure that she was whispering in his ear, giving him help and coaching, but that he was seen to be the one to do it. And that was very much how Tom acted. Yeah, but as far as developing the skills he needed to lead, it, it was slightly enabling. True, true. Um, but the the lessons he learns now are going to either be uh, learned the hard way of trial and error and try on his own, or from one source, which is Moraine. Well, and that's the thing. Tom wasn't giving him lessons to do it on his own. He was doing True. it for him. Now, now, that being said, in, in a grand world like this, you need people to do stuff like that for you. But it, it wasn't being done in a way to educate him in, in what he needs to do. That being said, she's still being selfish. <laughs> Yeah, well, not just selfish, but short-sighted mm -hmm. is the... She still wants to do those things. She just didn't want someone interfering in it. Yeah. Uh, I also think it's interesting that Moraine expects Perrin to be there and doesn't realize that he's gone. Uh, doesn't realize that he's leaving. Um, <clears throat> bottom of, of 341, this says a lot about both of these women and Perrin uh, while they're looking for him. Perhaps he is with Fael, Egwene said. He won't have run away, Moraine. Perrin has a strong sense of duty. Yeah, exactly. Which is why he went back to the two rivers. <laughs> Duh. you know the now, the now does she know about the two rivers because i know matt and perrin talk about it but and Rand i would knows. i would assume Egwene has heard the rumors moraine certainly knows yeah moraine certainly knows but uh egwene has been so intent on the dreaming and tanchico and the sisters matt learned about it through a matt and perrin learned about it through the town and Rand knew about it mm -hmm. because of his get it, getting getting news from all his yeah. lackeys now. So I don't know if Egwene would know. Um, remember, she is still a sixteen-year-old girl. She's yeah, she's collecting data as she can in in the capacity that a developing young woman would. 
Um, so when Rand finally shows up and starts talking, um, page 345, I knew he would not start a war, Gwen said fiercely. I knew it. You think there will be less killing in this, Moraine muttered? What was the boy up to? At least he was not running off to save his village while the Forsaken had their way with the rest of the world. Ah, uh, yes, as if that doesn't matter, too. Anyway, the corpses will be piled as high, girl. You will not know the difference between this and a war. Um, and I do wonder if Rand understands that. I think... I think a part of him might, but I don't know that he really understands it until the next book of what what this what this means. That as Moraine says, that you're not going to be welcomed with open arms. It's going to be, it might be, you know, less of a butcher's bill than if you went to war with Ilian, but it's it ain't going to be clean and it ain't going to be easy. Um, do you have any thoughts on his his little scheme here with sending so he sends one of the high ladies off to help feed because soldiers don't know anything about feeding and Moraine thinks oh, that's your first mistake because she'll have power to gain and you're underestimating this woman because she's a woman. But then he says, ah, but don't worry about your husband. I've moved her into the High Lady Astanda's apartments because ob obvious enemies there <clears throat> so that she can look after him while you're gone. Moraine shook her head slightly. He truly was harder than he had been, more dangerous. Egwene started toward the fallen woman, but Moraine put a hand on her arm. I think she was only overcome by emotion. I can recognize it, you see. The ladies are attending her. Um, Rand just did something very clever, I think, Egwene said in a flat voice, and very cruel. He has a right to look ashamed. Um, let's see. This is kind of a touch out of character for Rand because he is kind of as Moraine says, not undeserved because these aren't good people. Mm -hmm. uh, but he still is doing something cruel to both of these women with, with you know, feeding their feud against each other. Um, and, and, and we have already seen that Rand is very traditionally masculine. He comes from uh, a culture where you you would you would take injury to aid a woman and without hesitation well could this be a a uh, crossroads between where his education on this subject meets his ignorance because uh who knows where he got this cleverness from whether tom mm -hmm. was teaching him or this is from elaine's teachings or something along those lines you know, probably or, a synthesis, synthesis of them and then his own thoughts. Yeah, it, or even the first, uh, never, uh, never mind, that's the spoiler. Uh, then, But then his ignorance that, oh, this is going to stalemate everything, everybody's going to be fine. I had I had a thought about that. I, I kind of, my, my brain kind of clicked in gear while you were talking. I thought maybe that's where you were going is, yeah, he, he kind of looks ashamed because he's done, some, he, he's kind of d done something cruel here, but in in hindsight i do think at this point he he does think he can checkmate these people and uh and nobody's going to get hurt and nobody's going to get hurt yeah yeah and then with the reaction that happened with her passing out maybe a little realization like oh <laughs> maybe this is more serious than this, I thought. this this isn't so neat and clean yeah yeah, yeah. That would that would um, be where I went with it. 
Now the question is, where does he, where did he get this knowledge? Was it Elaine's teachings? Yeah. I, I suspect it was uh, a Elaine and then his own thoughts and then whatever, if, if there was anything Tom was doing that wasn't just in the shadows, but anything he might have whispered in in Rand's ear, it was probably a, a synthesis of all of it. Because we see, <clears throat> I mean, he, Rand ain't no dummy. Uh, that is one of the big things he has going for him. And, and we kind of see that early on from the very beginning of, of his scenes in Eye of the World. He is a thinker. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he may be limited in in knowledge just because he comes from a, a backwater of the world but he thinks he thinks things through he's not as uh, as rigorous a thinker as fairness you've pointed out he really is the middle of that of the of that that triumvirate mm -hmm. that he's kind of he's kind of a synthesis of matt and perrin um and and as we see here as he drives calendor into the heart this this appears to all be on his own of reading prophecies and thinking things through of okay what might this mean plus what do i need to do and well, I, this, I think that's where this comes from this is something that jordan did really well especially in the early books was and going into now is you get that that sense of this is not stupidity this is ignorance in the early days uh, and mm. then, and then it, you you see it with blocks, kind of it, like like a mental block, not like a block of of space, uh, a mental block going forward with all of all, all three of them, really. Uh, that it's like, I uh, why don't you just do this? But then it's really specific, like, well, I have this blind side. That... And to 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 Rand's credit, one of the things that makes him um, a both a good character and a a powerful person within the world is that unlike a lot of other people in contrast to what we're seeing here from Warren's perspective in this chapter Rand will will sometimes recognize what he doesn't know and 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 take caution from that one of the reasons he drives Kalendor into the heart is because what he did with it scared the crap out of him and rightfully so mm -hmm. I mean, he tried to raise someone from the dead, and it 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 turned into this necromantic farce uh, that that was gross and creepy and borderline evil, and he recognizes that. So, Moraine, all she can see is, you know, you need this. This this is a power, and you have to confront the Forsaken. Why are you leaving it behind? And Rand recognizes, you know. There's spoiler things that, that we can't talk about, but even just with this little kernel of experience, Rand recognizes something's wrong here, and I need to figure it out before I use this again. One. Mm -hmm. And two, as he says, you know, look on this and remember me, because he's going to have to leave, and he knows from his experience that the High Lords will bow and scrape and say, yes, sir, when he tells them something. And then as soon as they leave his presence, they're trying to figure out how to get around it. So he needs to leave them a reminder that they need to obey what he said. But then also he cites prophecy to Moraine of, you know, into the heart he thrusts the sword, into the heart he, to hold their hearts. Who draws it out shall follow after what hand can grasp that fearful blade. Um... So he, uh, and then we, then we end the chapter with something really ominous of Moraine thinking, I will not let, I will not let you go to the shadow. I have worked too long to allow that, whatever it takes. Um, but there is, there is an element there that's of, of blindness of, that's that's kind of the children of the light thinking of mm -hmm. all right she she's she's immediately concerned that you're either going mad or going to the shadow because you're not doing what i want you to do mm -hmm. that's that's very much children of the light thinking well she's she, let me let me write down something down for spoilers here yeah
she's in a she's in a mental trap that's similar to somebody else and it's kind of fitting in some ways okay well we might since we set the stage we might get into spoilers here soon because i've got till 4 15 which is okay well do you uh do you have any thoughts on the next chapter uh out of the stone as they get to Rudin, uh and the way they get there uh we do another portal stone but i don't think there was anything special about that right i mean the main thing that's of interest to me is that uh um we see more tav as rand without looking points at the symbol and matt flips a coin oh yeah uh, and it's the same it's the same thing that's so that's <laughs> that's their answer to this conundrum um and then we 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 start to get a little, little more of uh avienda which we'll see more as we go of uh because she she doesn't seem to like rand um and rand recognizes it uh so we we do see her pop up again and see a little bit of that um but then uh then he poofs them to Rahadine. and uh I know we didn't we didn't make it very far here, but there's a lot a lot to cover, and we do want to spend more time at Ruidine because there's so much that happens there. Well, and there's something to be said about spending time to set the stage. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's let's pause for a second, and then we'll get into spoilers. All right. So let's see if my voice will hold up for a little bit of spoiler. Although, you know, some of the spoiler things that I thought of um, with regards to Moraine, we don't really need to get into because we're actually going to see that here in a few chapters. Mm -hmm. um, because the, the, the cold hard fist of reality comes in pretty quick here when, when she goes through uh, Ruhadine and, and sees different possibilities and realities unfolding b before her. Um, well, it, is it the thing that made me that clicked in my mind, and, and maybe this is more a philosophical thing, but it would have been a spoiler. Was you you brought up you contrasted or compared, I should say, Moiraine with white mm -hmm. cloaks. Mm -hmm. But I think but I know also, where you're going here. But also, how similar is she mentally to Landfear? Oh, that's not where I thought you were going. <laughs> where did you think I was going? And then I'll go into my thought. Gallad. The, con the conundrum the conundrum that she has with her thinking of if you disagree with me then i'm worried you're going to the shadow and i won't let that happen whatever it takes and that's kind of the same conundrum that Gallad had which is interesting because aren't they of the same house they are you know he's a damadred right yeah well i mean you can kind of put him in into the no nah, you can't put him into what i was talking about because it's more in specific to the dealings of with rand Mm -hmm. okay because, because what they thought would motivate rand what they how they thought they could control rand oh, okay I are very much there. the same but different for di it's very much the same but for different reasons yeah I, I thought of him because i was thinking of that of that blinders thinking but when it specifically with regard to rand um, well, it, it is blinders thinking because it's, it's yeah. precisely why both ladies failed they thought mm -hmm. he needed power they thought he wanted power and that was going to be what what took him to victory whatever side you were on and, and they also both had a you're you're either with me or you're against me mentality mm -hmm. so i thought it was fitting because eventually they square off mm -hmm. and and that that was the uh the, the the two people trying to rule him in the same way to help him rule mm -hmm. were are the people that ended up duking it out and neither win at the end of the day that's that's actually a, a really good point that neither <laughs> one of them win they both lose in that face-off and they and, also and, both really lose in their reasons. influence of rand yeah and, and and really for similar reasons although moraine is able to at least get some influence back here um as she says because when when Egwene asks why you're acting like this i love uh, you know we'll get more into it when we actually get there of i i love her answer off i finally remembered how to embrace uh sidar 
Mm -hmm. But because her motives are still the same, she ultimately still fails. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Because she tries to use her embracing mood or embracing kind of personality to get him to still want the power and do things the way she wants. Right, because with her analogy there, yes, you surrender to the source, but then you are ultimately still in control. And where we saw Celine and Lanfear, it's the puppy dog eyes and I'm a, I'm a, I just need your protection, but still the ultimate goal was the same. Mm -hmm. I I do think she has a kind of recognition of things uh, at the end when she realizes, as she realizes that um, her time is coming to an end. And I, I think it it forces her to recognize, oh, crap, I've kind of screwed things up here. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and in the way she so that that's something we can keep an eye on as we go, because I, I do think the way she she acts with Rand uh, in the through the rest of this book and then, you know, on on, on through her her end at the at the end of the fires of heaven, that I, I do think she has come she does eventually come to a realization that I have handled this poorly. Uh, Mm -hmm. And and she, well, part of that is she does have a life changing event coming up Mm -hmm. here in a minute too. uh, Right. Again, we no need to spoil it too much because we're going to get to that here in a chapter or two where she goes through the rings, but it's. Um, Did you have any other spoiler thoughts? That was the first one that came to mind. Um, oh, I just, I'm sorry. My, my brain is brain farting. The, uh, I do think it's, it's interesting to see Moraine's evaluation of Egwene in light of where Egwene is going to end up of, uh, you know, uh, being impressed by her ability to recognize things, even if she doesn't fully understand it, mm-hmm. she she's got she's got really good instincts when it comes to reading people in situations. Um, and it is interesting to me that I don't think they ever have any sort of confrontation or even discussion when Maureen comes back, do they? Not that I know of. Mm, which which to me is another one of those kind of missed opportunities because of how influential Maureen was, but then she never really reconnects with Egwene or even Sawan, um, you know, which is awkward since they're creepy lesbian lovers oh yeah i forgot about that Uh, uh, what chapter was that in great hunt maybe yeah they're uh they're they're creepy creepy foray into whatever the heck that magical teleportation world is it would have had to been the world of dreams There's no other place it could have been unless they had unless they're gonna reveal that they had discovered traveling. I think when we were ranting about this, I, I think I recall reading that the the uh <clears throat> the thing they use is a Terran Greel that is key to a specific place and takes you there. So I think that was actually supposed to be the hut she grew up in and a Turing reel takes them there, which I think is even dumber than the world of dreams because of <laughs> you have two of the most powerful Aes Sedai just sitting in tier where it's illegal. But then also the dialogue was like someone who only knew about relationships from watching porn. Yeah, well, that and the fact that they would have hijacked what would be one of the most powerful Terran Grill 
to travel to take it back to your hut for personal reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So many things wrong. Do we have to watch the second season? Yeah, we've kind of committed ourselves to it. We have, haven't we? Damn it. Yeah. Damn that whole honor thing. We'll we'll uh brew up something good <laughs> to help us through. You know what I'm tempted to do? Just watch the trailer for each episode and then make up something and see if I'm right. It's a good idea. <laughs> um so on to to Scott's comments, if you don't have any more spoilery yeah, things, there was, there was plenty to go through. Um, I do, I do think he, that that is is I'd forgotten about Moraine's reaction in the Great Hunt when they they first meet, and uh, and, and so I do think Moraine knows more than she lets on, as she almost always does. Um, but I, I agree. I'm pretty convinced that most everyone in the tower knows who the movers and shakers in the world are. That would make a lot of sense. Now, some of the Browns who only care about history, yeah, they probably don't know. But uh, the the Blues and the Greys especially are going to know not just who the rulers of the, the world are, but then who their families are, because that matters. Um, and so it... it as as close as she is to the throne, <clears throat> especially since the the queen doesn't, not only is the queen not having children, I'm pretty sure she's not even married yet. Um, I'm pretty sure Queen, queen Tenobia isn't even married. So it it would who who her extended family is would matter a lot because that would be determined determined succession. So. Uh, actually, yeah, there there is a good chance that Moraine knows exactly who Zareen Bashir is, mm -hmm. even, if, even if she's never met. Um, so, in in that light, <clears throat> that kind of let me flip back here to because there is a point <clears throat> where. All right, so page 342 is where they're talking about – we kind of mentioned this when when Egwene and Moraine are talking about, you know, where's Perrin. Um, it kind of puts that into a different light when, uh, when Moraine says, Fael has been trying to talk him into leaving, girl. Quite, quite possibly he was with her. He usually was. Do not look so surprised. They often talk and argue where they can be overheard. I am not surprised you know, Gwen said dryly, only that Fael would try to talk him out of what he knows he has to do. Perhaps she does not believe it as he does. Moraine had not believed it herself at first, had not even seen it. Three Tavarin, all the same age, coming out of one village, blah, 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 blah. So, <clears throat> um... Uh, I like her, Gwen said. She is good for him, just what he needs, and she cares for him deeply. I suppose he does. If Fael became too troublesome, Moraine would have to talk with her about the secrets Fael had been keeping from Perrin, or have mm -hmm. one of her eyes and ears doing. That should settle her down. Um, yeah, and she, I don't even know if she knew her real name. Who? Moraine. Oh, she knew Zareen, yeah. Because when when uh, yeah, but she didn't know Zareen to Pash Bashir. La da da da. There's probably more than one Zareen in the world. True. Given given what it's supposed to mean. But she knew it was a Saldean name. I have to go back and look actually and see if she mentions her last name. Uh, I don't think she does. But it wouldn't be that hard for Maureen to figure out. I mean, she knows it's a Saldean name. She mentions. I do remember that that she mentions that when Perrin asks. You know, a girl named Zareen, what would you, you know, what would, what would you think about that? Um, and it wouldn't be that hard for her to figure out this is that Zareen. Um, but 
it kind of it kind of makes me think that what she's thinking there when she's discussing Fail is that her her concern with her is that this is a royal. This is someone just a, a, a few places removed from the throne. She's going to have her own objectives, her own goals, and they don't necessarily coincide with mine. Mm. Uh, let's see what what thought did I just oh I was on the comments hold on uh, after the battle of two rivers Perrin listens to too much my chemical romance yeah yeah but you know yeah, uh, that made me laugh I would say Jordan's pretty descriptive and there was a serious lack of eyeliner so it, so he doesn't go too far at least yeah Uh, so I, I don't understand the Fael hate, but I do understand Scott and others hate for Gawain because <laughs> there's, I don't know if this was on purpose or not, but he is a very unlikable character for a very long time. Uh, and he starts off as someone who is a very likable, sympathetic character. Uh, and then he turns into uh you know i hadn't thought about this before and this is something to think about when we get to these scenes down the road is that gawain turns into galad but more so everything that he complains about with galad he does he becomes incredibly rigid in his thinking to the point where it actually leads him to commit, as Scott points out, these are things that could easily be considered atrocities, the things that he does. What Whereas, was the thing that, that he did that, just because I'm drawing a blank, that's, that Scott might be alluding to? Well, since you read the, let, the latest ones more recently. Let, yeah, let us, let us know if uh, exactly what you're talking about. But I'm assuming he means either... Um, uh, fighting against the the other uh, warders and, and trainers there in the tower, the fighting that he led against the tower. But probably I think what he means is not doing anything about Rand being tortured because what was being done to him was absolutely torture. Uh, oh, you're talking about in, Lord, yeah, in, not, in the box. Not, not, not metaphorical or hypo, hyperbolic, but what is done to him in Lord of Chaos is absolutely torture. And he, sit, he does nothing about it, and his rationalization in his mind, to Scott's point, is infantile. It is, well, I, I didn't say I would do this. Okay, well, you're, you're splitting hair so that you can get what you want because you hate Rand. But in your mind, you still want to be loyal to Egwene. Um, wh whereas the things they complain about Galad is that he would do the right thing and you would get in trouble as a child. It's like, you know, snitches get stitches. Uh, but, uh, you know, so this is what you're complaining about with Galad is that he would get you in trouble as children, children's trouble. But now you're actually killing people and allowing people to be tortured based on the rigidity of your own thinking and your post hoc rationalizations of of those actions and your reasons for those actions. But then so, at the end of the day, when it became real life, he tried to, to balance the scales by helping his sister, but also trying to do the right thing. Yeah. As but a I, I, I don't. Yeah. And, and Gawain, I don't know how much of it is. It just wasn't written well and how much of it, this was always Jordan's plan. But when, he, when he comes to these real, when Gawain comes to these realizations, he never quite, returns to who he was still even to the very bitter end whereas Galad uh he softens and becomes a little more like Gawain was when we first met him even though he's still you know very lawful capital L in his thinking he does soften and see the human side and the exceptions uh because of what he has to go through so, uh, and so he becomes a very sympathetic character. 
Galad is lawful good, mm. whereas Gawain becomes lawful neutral, where his rigid mindset on the worldview because I think if we're going to have a good and evil, if we're going to use the D and D analogies, I think it's because he starts off as chaotic good, and that chaos leads him into places that he instinctively, reflexively doesn't like. So he has to create the post hoc rationalizations for it. And we're actually uh, going to get there because I think it. We, we we kind of skipped over the the uh, the rebellion in the tower. Um, I think that's at the end, towards the end of this book. Yeah, it is because they have to they have to be in the they have to be in Saladar for the for the next book so that the the girls can find them there. Uh, so we, we we will we will get to that. Oh, here. We gotta, uh, yeah, we got to have a little min kind of skipped section. over. Yeah, we got to have a little min section. Yeah. Um. But I haven't really thought that through. Of why is Gawain stay so unlikable and Galad becomes much more sympathetic as the series. Well, maybe the on. maybe the answer is simple. Maybe just like Sanderson had trouble writing Matt because he was so different than anything he thought. Maybe Gawain was a, a character Jordan intended to be a certain way, but mm. he was so unlike him that he had trouble writing him. Yeah. Yeah. Could be. Um, that 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 is something we'll have to keep an eye on when we get to kind of Gawain's come to Jesus moment. Yeah, uh, way later in the series. Because it's either that or he wanted you to not like him. Because it's pretty universal to hate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I, so Scott, comment on this as well is 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 Gawain one of the reasons you don't like Egwene and don't like her story as much? Because I was thinking that that same thought too. Or is your dislike for Egwene leak over mm-hmm. into your dislike for Gawain? Because they have, <laughs> or you, you just know, think they're a perfect match, and you hated both to begin and, with, and you. <laughs> and this is this is something we'll we can talk about. Um, we'll talk about in a couple of books. Is uh, that that will be an interesting contrast between what we spent so much time talking about with Perrin's storyline and the complementarianism of Fael. And I I kind of do see a Gawain and Gawain as a an interesting case study in a toxic relationship. I... Well, Egwene is a good example of, so we've talked about narcissism and competence, the difference. Egwene is a good example of becoming competent so quickly that you can't mature into it. Mm. And, and everybody talk, uses the word maturity for her that she's more mature for her age. She's more mature for her skill level and everything. No, she's competent. She's able to do all these things. She's able to master all these things very quickly. But the decisions she makes later on that are annoying, that causes people to to not like her are immature. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're someone who knows they have, they, they know they have the ability, but they don't have quite the, the uh grown-up mentality that needs to go along with it so i i just thought of an interesting analogy that's a good place to leave it off to say let's keep an eye on this because Egwene's story is wrapped up in Rand's story here as we go to to finish the shadow rising but there's a difference between a prodigy and then and someone who comes to it later in life so the and you see it especially in tennis stars because they start so young uh, and if you look at like Naomi Osaka or or even the Williams sisters, or at least one of them at certain points, that these these prodigies, they start so young and this is all they know. Tiger Woods is another one, an example of someone who kind of sort of had a complete mental breakdown because this was his whole life from the age of five versus, and, and I was thinking of, um, you know, you can you can find different athletes, especially like football players of I didn't even start playing football until I was a sophomore, junior in high school. And then they go on to the NFL and they're completely different people, not not athletes, but just people. And Egwene is a prodigy. She she has the spark. She's incredibly powerful uh, and she has an ability to learn and develop 
quickly in her talents, but that doesn't co- necessarily coincide with developing psychologically. Contrast that with Nynaeve, who was a fully developed person, mostly developed person. She she's she's in her she's in her mid twenties. She's she's an established adult. Then she gets this power. Then she starts to realize her talent with a capital T here in this thing. And and it it leads to very different actions and reactions down the road as they become more powerful and more established as Aes Sedai. Well, and, and since you brought up both of them, there's a difference in development here. So not only the age, but you have Nynaeve is older. She finds out she has this amazing power when she's already mature, but yet she's humbled at certain points in her journey. Mm -hmm. Whereas Egwene is very young, impressionable, finds out she has this power, has an aptitude for it, but gets traumatized many times along the way and and then thrust into power. Mm -hmm. And and so so the development uh, kind of model is completely different between the two. And you see which one gives the better result. Uh, and yeah, that's a good place to end. I, I don't know if that's what causes the Egwene hate, but at the same time, you can see where one would lead to lead to a, a more positive result. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll we will keep uh, keep an eye on these things. Keep discussing them as we go, and we should be able to make it. Uh... Well, I say that, but we've got. <laughs> We've got several different things about to happen here with Rand going into Ruhadine and what he sees, but then we also have Matt and what he sees. But then while that's going on, we have Egwene starting to learn from the wise ones and also tied into that is Moraine going into Ruhadine. And while we don't see what she sees, we see the effects of it. Mm -hmm. So there is quite a bit to talk about coming up. So it may, it may take us a little while to get, to get through Wurvadine and then on to what happens as they leave. Well, say maybe for next time, if we can get a two hour block, Mm -hmm. we might be able to cover all that in a 30 minute spoiler. Uh, Yeah. If, if we're on task and we kind of get our thoughts ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, I'll, I'll have to take more detailed notes, I think for the next one, because there's, there's so much going on and it needs to be. Well, uh, and and so much of what happens in, uh, in the rings and, and in the mist and everything kind of gives you a glimpse of spoiler as well. So it might shorten just because we want to kind of save some of that. Yeah. Kind of a remember when this happened uh, kind of thing. All right. Well, then we are, we are done uh, with this ranting and discussing of the shadow rising only made it a couple of chapters, but we should be able to make it a lot farther next time we say that every time but we say that every time uh going forward also give us your comments on we did the first three books all chronological mm-hmm. and we split this one up which one do you think worked better i think this one prolonged because of the way we split it up but yeah. it also got a little bit more in depth so uh so let us know in the comments which one do you like better and uh like share subscribe one of my biggest weaknesses is I don't market myself very well. So market for me, uh, share us and, uh, we'll do it in the next one. I think this is episode 90, right? I think so. 90. All right. Later guys. See ya.